Hi everyone, in this video I'll be doing Advent of Code 2021, Day 21. I'll be doing the puzzles, then explaining them in detail afterwards. As usual, the code is in the description below if you want to check that out, and let's get started with the puzzles. Alright, time to explain the puzzles. Day 21, Dirac Dice. Uh, we are asked to play a game with the submarine. Um, in summary, this game consists of a die and some pawns, and the pawns move around a circular track uh, according to the results of the die, and scores are accumulated as the pawns move around. Uh, for part one, the die, are, the die is deterministic, so we need to find the ending state of the game and do some computation on it. Uh, hopefully you read the puzzle. It's kind of confusing if you haven't, so I'm sure you have. For part one. Here's how I did it. I made a bunch of classes and uh, I made a bunch of classes basically. So we have a player function, uh, a player class which keeps track of the score and the position of a player. We have this function here to advance the player a certain number of steps according to a die. So given a die, advance the player. Uh, we also have this function to detect whether the player is winning. If you would like to see this code, it's in the GitHub repository. So don't worry if you don't have all this down right now. And then we have this dice, which is staying the same throughout both players, and we just need to keep track of its value. Because for part one, the value goes from one, and it just counts up. So we have this function to roll the die and return what uh, it, the sum of three rolls, because that's how uh, moves, are, moves are computed for part one. Um, and then we just initialize these player one and player two according to the input. Uh, and then we just advance them, advance them until someone wins, and when someone wins, we compute uh, this, which is the losing player score times the number of rolls of the die. So that's pretty simple. Um, did it according to classes, and I think that made it pretty convenient. All right, part two is a bit more complicated. It's a lot more complicated. So the real die is not deterministic. It has three faces. Um, each face is one, two, or three, and what's weird is that this die splits reality into three separate realities for every outcome. So it does some quantum stuff and we split into different universes. So we are asked uh, to f again play the game, except this time the limit is 21 instead of 1000. And we, did find, uh, we need to find the number of universes in which player one wins and compare that to the number of universes in which player two wins. So you can imagine that if we were to compute this directly, we would end up with some huge tree. So for the first roll, we would have three possible states. Then for the second roll, we would have nine possible states, and it would just branch out very quickly uh, and be very, very impossible to handle. So instead, we have to use some math to reduce this tree a bit and just reduce the number of possible states that we have to search, because you can notice the answer is quite huge, and we can't possibly simulate that many universes at once. So, how did I do it? Well, first of all, uh, every three rolls can be summarized as its total, right? So, since they're one, two, and three, the minimum possible value of the sum is three, and the maximum possible value is nine. Now, what's important here is only the number of ways we can attain this, uh, this value. So, the, the value that is the sum. Uh, for three, there's only one way to do it, which is one, one, one. Um, so, that's one here. For four, it, we can only do it by 1, 1, 2, and that gives us uh, three possible ways because we can permute them in three different ways. The two can go in one of three places. For five, we have 1, 2, 2, and 1, 1, 3, and that gives us 3 plus 3, which is 6. And we can do similar computations for the rest of the numbers, and that just gives us the number of ways to, for every sum of three rolls to happen. Um, and this is going to make our lives a lot easier because now we don't have to consider every single roll. We only have to consider groups of three rolls, um, and we can do some multiplication with these uh, number of ways to achieve that sum. Now, the crux of my solution is really this dynamic programming method. Uh, dynamic programming, if you're not familiar with it, is basically a way to use recursion, except we don't have to compute redundant values. So, for example, if we've computed the answer for a case before, then we don't have to redo that computation. We store it in memory, and we can just access it later um, in what's called a cache. So in Python, there's this really handy method, um, this really handy thing. Um, it's called LRU cache, and it caches results of a function so long as it's hashable. So anyway, I have this function that takes in 
a position, a score, a turn, and an initial position. And this is the question the function is asking. How many ways are there to attain the given score in the given number of moves landing on a given position starting at a given position? Um, this function is going to be useful. I'll explain why it's useful, and then I'll go into actually what this function um, is doing on the inside. So let's just assume this function works, and we know how to find the number of ways to attain a score given all this starting information. Now, here's the fun bit. We are going to use a little bit of brute force here. So we are going to consider for every possible number of moves in which player one wins, and for every possible score that player one wins with, how many possible ways are there for player two to do the same number of moves, except minus one because player one goes first, um, with a losing score, so a score of less than 21. How many ways are there to do this? Um, and we multiply these two values together, and that gives us the total number of ways in which player one wins with n moves and a score of s because we need to find the number of ways that player one wins, first of all, but we also need to consider what player two does. So we need to multiply those two together, and hopefully you see why this is true. So if we have, if we imagine that every turn consists of a move by player one and a move by player two, then just considering player one, uh, that's maybe this top row over here, these ending scores and positions, right? We also need to consider positions. Um, we're sort of computing the number of ways in which player one wins uh, up here and then doing the same, uh, sorry, computing the number of ways in which player two loses down here. And we're going to repeat this for every possible number of moves, every possible winning score, and every possible starting, um, sorry, every possible ending position for player one. And we're going to do the same for part, uh, player two, except uh, same number of moves, minus one, um, and a losing score, so player two cannot have attained a score of 21 or more. And we also need the final position of player two. So we're going to loop through all of these using these uh, five nested for loops, considering every possible ending configuration. Um, and then we're going to compute the number of ways in which that ending configuration can be attained. And again, we're using this multiplication because player one and player two are essentially independent in their moves. And then we're going to do the same for player two. Um, how many ways are there for player two to win in a given number of moves or an ending position and a score, and multiply that by the number of ways player one can lose. Uh, so this function generalizes that into a the winning player's starting position, the ending player's, uh, the losing player's starting position, as well as whether the winning player is player one, because we need to do some counting for player one going first and player two ending a move earlier if player one wins. So yeah, we do some brute force, uh, assuming that this function works just considering all possible ending configurations and seeing in how many player one and player two win. Now, uh, how do we actually do this function? How do we find, how do we answer this question that we had earlier? Well, we are going to use recursion. We're going to find all the possible ways to do something, uh, which is which you might think is slow, but again, we're using this memoization. So it'll actually be pretty fast. So let's do some case work. We are ending in a given position, right? So we have the circle, let's do an example. Uh, suppose we're ending in position 8 with a score of uh, 13, all right? And our starting position is 5, and we have one move. So starting in 5, how many ways are there to end at 8 with a score of uh, 13? So we're going to consider everything that could have happened leading up to this final move, ending at 8. Uh, we could have rolled a 3, a 4, a 5, or all the way to a nine as our last roll, uh, considering roll as groups of three, because remember our work earlier, uh, deducing the number of ways for every sum to occur. These are the possibilities. These are the possibilities that could have happened on the last move. So for every one of those possibilities, we're going to step backwards. We're gonna step backwards. So for example, for if we rolled a three on the last one, that means we out, we're on a five on the last turn with a score of 13 minus eight, because uh, remember, our score is computed by adding the current position. So uh, the last score was 13 minus 8. We were on 5, and we have 0 moves. So that's the example. might be a bit confusing here, but that's essentially what is happening, happening here. Considering every possible last step, this is where we were at on the last step. This was our score on the last step. This was our number of turns on the last step. Uh, initial position stays the same. 
this is all the possible ways um, to reach our ending states given uh, a given possibility. So we loop through all these possibilities, add together everything that happened before, and we get our answer. Now we do have some edge cases. First of all, the base cases, which is uh, the first. First of all, if we're starting out, if we're starting out, our turn is zero. And that means our score has to be zero because score will start at zero and our position has to match the initial position. So only if that is true do we return one, otherwise uh, none, it's impossible um, because we can't have a positive score on turn zero and our position can't change um, on turn zero. Otherwise, uh, if the score is negative or this is probably unnecessary actually, so I might as well delete that. We can't have a negative score obviously on any turn. Um, and then inside this loop, considering what happened at the previous step, if at the previous step, I mean, this is also probably not, not necessary. Actually, that is necessary. Um, if at the previous step we already won, then we don't want to consider that previous step at all because we would have already won and we won't, wouldn't be doing this turn. And that's all the edge cases in this function. So as a summary, this function is answering the question, how many ways are there to attain a given score in a given number of moves land, landing on a given position um, and starting at a given position? And using this function, we can do a brute force on all possible ending configurations, given the number of ways for a player to win and the number of ways for the loser to lose, multiplying those together, um, and that gives the number of ways for this player to win. We do that for both player one and player two, and then compute whichever one is most. So, I mean, that's what the problem is asking. How many ways are there for the winner to win? All right, and that's it for explaining day 21 of Advent of Code 2021. I hope you found today's video helpful and I hope you enjoyed the puzzles. I just wanna say thank you for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Code is in the GitHub repository as always, linked below. And I'll see you tomorrow for day 22.